So the next aspect that I'm looking at is simulating high altitude training. The first part of the presentation was looking at our everyday breathing habits, the importance of light breathing, the importance of breathing through the nose. Now here we look at simulating high altitude training that we can simulate and get the beneficial effects of high altitude without having to go to high altitude. In other words, we breathe, bring the mountain to you. Because the disadvantages of high altitude training are as follows. One is it's very expensive. Secondly, there's mixed results because really to get the beneficial effects, we would want to be living at a high altitude, but to train at sea level. Because if you try and train at high altitude, there's going to be a deconditioning effect. So it could lead to muscle deconditioning. Um, whereas we can combine the two. We can bring in breath holding to get some of the beneficial effects of high altitude. Whereas at the same time, athletes are able to train according to their normal schedule. So in order to talk about high altitude training, we need to consider the makeup of the blood. And blood is made up of three parts. You've got your oxygen carrying red cells, you've got your white cells, and you've got your plasma. Hemoglobin is the main carrier of oxygen in the blood. And with hemoglobin, it allows up to 70 times more oxygen to be carried because oxygen is relatively insoluble in water. And as a result, it needs something to carry it inside in the blood cells. And hemoglobin is the protein that carries that. So another factor to consider is, of course, hematocrit. And hematocrit refers to the percentage of red blood cells in the blood. Under normal conditions, hematocrit will closely relate to the concentration of hemoglobin. And hematocrit is usually found to be 40.7 to 55% for males and 36.1 to 44.3% for females. Performance improves with an increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit, which increases oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, thus improving aerobic ability. Because we have to consider it this way. Oxygen is fuel. If we have got increased hematocrit, if we have increased hemoglobin, it means that we can carry more oxygen. So the individual then has improved aerobic capacity that they can work with you know, more intensity while at the same time staying oxygenated. And that would be the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic basically means without air, that an individual is pushing themselves to the point that you know, they've, they've gone from an aerobic state, which they had sufficient oxygen, to an anaerobic state where oxygen levels are less than what they should be. And for hundreds of thousands of years, breath holding was extensively practiced by our ancestors for the purposes of foraging for food. And it also might have been responsible for a number of unique human features. And the reason I mention this is because this program does include breath holding. And sometimes people will think, you know, is breath holding it's something strange? And, you know, it's actually a very, very normal activity. When you were a child, you probably went to a swimming pool and you swam down to the bottom of the pool, you picked up a penny and you come back up to the surface. And also, you know, when evolutionary theorists are, are looking at unique features in the human body, even to this day, um, Ama people who are off the, off the coast of Japan, they forage for their food at the bottom of the ocean floor. So, and they've been doing this practice for thousands of years. So breath holding, it's, it's something that's very natural to the human body. And for most people, after a week or so of practice, we can drop the oxygen saturation to below 90%. And this is a level that's comparative to the effects of living at an altitude of between 3 and 4,000 meters. So normal oxygen saturation in the blood, normal SpO2, it's between 95 to 99%. And we don't, we don't expect 100% because oxygen is constantly diffu diffusing from the blood to the cells. So, you know, with normal breathing, which would be light, quiet and calm, our blood is almost fully saturated with oxygen. Now, when we want to get the beneficial effects of simulating high altitude training, it's important to drop our oxygen saturation to below normal. And below normal would be anything below 94%. Now, ideally, to go below 90%. Now, when the individual first practices this, they don't necessarily, you know, it can take a week or so of practice to, to drop the oxygen saturation to below 90%. But with the exercises that I use, um, pretty much all individuals, um, without exception, 
you know, can drop their oxygen saturation, certainly below 94%, and the vast majority to below 90%. And in terms of this, if we look at the oxygen saturation at altitude, when we drop our oxygen saturation, the SAO2, to below 90%, if we bring it across to the, the SAO2 line there and we bring it down, it's giving an approximate reading of about 3,000 meters. So in other words, we can simulate an altitude of 3,000 meters, three kilometers high, very easily by simply holding the breath. And in terms of holding the breath, what actually takes place in the body? Well, in considering that, we have to take into account the spleen. And sometimes, you know, the spleen was regarded as an organ that doesn't actually do all that much, but the spleen is actually our blood bank. So it acts as a blood bank by absorbing excess volume and releasing stores during increased oxygen demands or decreased oxygen availability. So if there's too much blood, the spleen will hold on to it. When there's insufficient blood, the spleen will release blood into circulation. And in terms of breath holding, this paper here showed that five maximum breath holds with the face immersed in cold water and each breath hold was separated by a two minute rest that the spleen size decreased by 20%. And this indicates that yes, the body of course sensed that oxygen levels have dropped. So the spleen then comes in there to release more red blood cells into circulation. And by doing that, the size of the spleen has decreased by 20%. In this paper, the researchers concluded that the results show a rapid, probably active contraction of the spleen in response to breath holding in humans. In another paper, results showed a 6.4% increase to hematocrit and a 3.3% increase to hemoglobin concentration following five breath holds. And remember we were talking about earlier, hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen in the blood. Hematocrit is the percentage of our entire blood that's carrying oxygen. So if we can improve hemoglobin and by virtue of improving hematocrit, we can improve performance. In this paper here, significant splenic contraction has been found to take place with even very short breath holds of just 30 seconds. However, the researchers did find that the strongest contractions of the spleen are shown following maximum breath holds. So when we're talking about maximum breath holds, I'm not talk talking to the point that, you know, we're holding the breath until we basically pass out because that's not going to be safe. And secondly, there's no need for it. When I'm talking about doing maximum breath holds, I'm talking about holding the breath after an exhalation for as long as possible. But that the individual, you know, they don't feel stressed. Yes, of course, there's going to be some, some feeling of discomfort. But when they resume breathing, that they can, they can gain back their breath within a couple of breaths. Because with this, it's like everything else. We want to challenge the body, but we don't want to overdo it. In this study here, after three breath holes, the increase in hemoglobin in the hypercapnic higher carbon dioxide trial was 9.1% greater than in the normal carbon dioxide trial and 71.1% greater than in the lower carbon dioxide trial. And this here is relevant for our own work because our breath holes, the oxygen advantage breath holes are performed after an exhalation. The individual takes a normal breath in, normal breath out, and then holds the breath. Now, the effect that this has is that it leads to a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So while oxygen levels are dropping, carbon dioxide, of course, is accumulating. And in terms of the, the benefits of it are that after a breath hold, it's easier to lower oxygen saturation to simulate high altitude training. And in consideration that when carbon dioxide levels are higher, the effect is even greater. Richardson concluded that an increased capnic stimulus during breath hold may elicit a stronger spleen response and subsequent hemoglobin increase than a breath hold preceded by hyperventilation. Because a lot of the times people who are doing breath holding, they actually hyperventilate beforehand to get rid of their carbon dioxide stores. Now this does allow them to hold their breath for longer. But as we have seen, it's actually beneficial to hold onto our carbon dioxide. Don't hyperventilate before holding your breath. Just take that normal breath in, normal breath out, and hold your breath and relax into your body as we will talk about later. So earlier on we talked about the spleen and splenic contraction in terms of holding the breath. And another consideration is EPO or erythropoietin. 
and EPO is a hormone that's produced inside the body and it's synthesized by the kidneys and also to some extent by the liver and basically EPO sends a message to the bone marrow to produce or to mature more red blood cells and it's for this reason that a lot of athletes were taking EPO artificially so by doing that of course then it increased oxygen carrying capacity in the blood and with increased carrying capacity you were able to push yourself for harder and for longer in that aerobic state because you were able to get more oxygen to the muscles. So EPO, it's secreted by the kidney in response to chronic hypoxia and it stimulates the maturation of the red blood cells in the bone marrow, increasing oxygen delivery to the muscles, thereby enhancing sports performance. And results show that after three sets of five maximum duration breath holds, with each set separated by 10 minutes, that EPO concentration increased by 24%, which peaked at three hours after the final breath hold and returned to baseline two hours later. So breath holding increases EPO. And looking at patients who have obstructive sleep apnea who are involuntarily holding their breath during their sleep, the results showed a 20% increase to EPO in patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And once then the, the patients were using a CPAP machine, which of course reduced the times that they were holding their breath, um, EPO, it decreased. So here's very interesting research, and it's to establish the effects of an eight-week hypercapnic, which is high carbon dioxide, hypoxic, low, low oxygen training program in elite male swimmers. And basically they were training for 30 to 45 minutes by three times per week. And each test subject, they withheld their breath individually by a subjective feeling for as long as possible. The condition is that the breath hold, it had to be above the minimum values which describe hypercapnia. In other words, normal carbon dioxide is 40 millimeter of mercury pressure. So in this situation here, the breath had to be held to the point that it increased CO2 levels above 45 millimeter of mercury. And besides the swimming training sessions, the control group, they were subjected to additional aerobic training sessions on the treadmill, but without breath holding. The program was conducted for three times a week for eight weeks. So it's a very, very interesting um, study. You've got elite swimmers, you've got your control group, and you've got your breath hold group. It found that in the experiment, so the groups that were doing the breath holding, their pre-hemoglobin was 144.63 before, and at the end of eight weeks, it was 152.38. So hemoglobin increased by 5.35%. Now, the control group actually reduced, their hemoglobin reduced during that time. And in terms of VO2 max, the experimental group, which were doing the breath holding, their VO2 max pre was 63.8 and our VO2 max at the end of eight weeks was 70.38, which showed a 10.79% improvement to VO2 max. So considerable improvements. And taking into account the control group, they, they increased very, very marginally and not to the point of significance. So they were 59.46 pre and 60.81 post. Here is another study looking at 15 middle distance runners and they would have been running between 600 and 3,000 meters, and the study was conducted over six weeks. So the runners participate in official athletics competition before and after the study, so that was the way to gauge whether there was an improvement to performance. The first group who did normal breathing, they showed a plus 0.03% of an improvement. The second group, who did 15 to 20 minutes of breath holding on the exhalation once a week, which is pretty much exactly what we're doing, they showed a plus 1.27% improvement. And the third group, who were doing 15 to 20 minutes of breath holding on the exhalation twice per week, they showed a plus 1.33% of an improvement. Now, 1.33% mightn't seem all that much, but in terms of elite performance, the difference between one athlete and another is generally about 0.5 of a percent. So there are significant differences here. And when we consider, you know, the long-term effects of breath holding, that when we're holding the breath, 
it's not something that's just beneficial in the short term. That resting hemoglobin mass in trained breath hole divers, it was found to be 5% higher than in untrained. And in addition, breath hole divers, they show a larger rate of increase to hemoglobin after three apneas. So there's a training effect there. The more we're doing it, the more we bring it into our training schedules, we get benefits not just in the short term, but also over the longer term as well. And then this paper kind of confirms the same as what was found in the other, in that pre-test hemoglobin tended to be higher in the diver group than both skiers and untrained. So divers had 150.1, skiers had 145.5, and untrained 146.9.